So why supracondylar humerus in pediatrics? Why not uh, the other fractures? Because this is of uh, gained a lot of importance because of other complications. And what are types of supracondylar humerus fractures? So basically, the, those are the important things. What can be asked and uh, what are things that can be asked even in MCQs? I mean, for entrance point of view as well. So we'll be talking more about that. The common nerve injuries in supracondylar. This is again a, a topic which is of more importance for uh, UG students for the entrance point of view. And uh, as a complications, what are the complications of supracondylar? How deadly it is if you are not treating, treating them properly. So this is an example. This is an X-ray which uh, we had seen in our institute, uh, where we can most of them will be confusing this with the elbow dislocation. But this is not a case of elbow dislocation. This is a newborn case where the child is presented with the birth injury. This is a, one of the birth injury where we can see there is a facial separation. Yeah, where unable to are... see your uh, slides. Yes. Is it now visible? No. Is it now visible, my screen? No, sir. No, no, it is visible. Yeah, fine. So, are the slides moving? Yes, sir. Yeah, fine. So, as I said, uh, this is an example, one of the uh, case which we got in our institute, where we can see uh, facial separation. Most of them will be confused this with the elbow dislocation, but this is not a case of elbow dislocation. This is a physical separation, which is seen as a birth injury. So that's why it is more important in pediatrics, uh, supracondylar humerus. So supracondylar humerus is one of the most common fractures what we see in children. It constitutes about seven to 9% of the upper extremity fractures. Peak age, what we see in the supracondylar humerus is between uh, five to 10 years with uh, five to six years is a peak uh, what we see more commonly among the children. So before starting a supracondylar humerus fracture, let us know something about the anatomy. So the distal humerus is formed by a medial column, lateral column, and a triage. So medial column is basically formed by a uh, non-articular portion of a medial uh, supracondylar ridge as well as a uh, medial epicondyle and some portion of medial condyle. While the lateral condyle, lateral column is formed by a lateral supracondylar ridge as well as a, a, a capitulum. While the in-between triage is basically mainly the trochlea which is involving and the articular surface which is connecting between the medial epicondyle and the capitulum. So coming to this ossification sequence, which is again, the more important and can be asked in your exams. So is, uh, what is the ossification sequence? Before knowing the age for that, you should know exactly the age of the kid. So how to identify that? So this is ossification center, ossifications at what timing uh, they occur in the elbow. So for that, there is a mnemonic known as CRITO, C-R-I-E-T-O-E. -E. So that is C for capitulum, which occurs by the age of one year, radial head approximately around four years. So we can think that it is always in the uh, odd numbers, one, three, five, seven, nine, and 11. So capitulum by one year, radial head somewhere around three to four years, a middle epicondyle by around five years, and olecranon by around seven years, trochlea by nine years, and lateral epicondyle by 11 years of age. So, uh, this is one of the slide why it is important because supracondylar humerus again there is as I said supracondylar humerus is uh, known for more complications more complications because of vascular injury compartment such kind of things so for that purpose I just show this image uh, to know which artery there is a brachial artery which is dividing below but above there is something known as supratrochlear artery which is more important for uh, the kinking of brachial artery or sometimes a brachial artery injury because of that artery okay so, and then this is an x-ray which shows the blood supply basically of capitulum and the uh, capitulum. The, here the, we get the blood supply basically for capitulum from the posterior aspect. So always when you're planning for a supracondylar humerus surgery, when you're planning for open reduction, never go posterior. If, you, if there is a high chance for the high chance that you can damage a vascular injury to the capitulum. So always you can go a medial, medial anteromedial, anterolateral or anterior approach, which is better for supracondylar humerus rather than going for posterior approach, which is known for notorious for complications. So this is again a dual blood supply for a trochlea. We have got so one from the non-articular surface, other coming from the articular surface, which is crossing to the physis. Why it is important? 
So there is a high chance for avascular necrosis sometimes for trochlea, which is going, though that presents classically like fish tail sign. When there is a one of the artery which is disrupted, which goes for avian, then the lateral part is growing up, medial part is growing up, but the center part, which is a tie arch, is not growing up. So it forms like a fish tail. So it is not a, the, the, for that purpose, this blood supply, dual blood supply is more important. And uh, supracortical humerus fracture is classified into two types, basically flexion type and extension type. Flexion type constitutes about 98%, while extension type constitutes about 98%, while the flexion type constitutes only about 2%. So classification, what we see is a Gartland's classification, so which is more commonly used for supracondylar humerus. So we'll uh, see what is exactly the Gartland's uh, classification in X-rays. Mechanism of injury, uh, the more important because, again, because extension type, how does the mechanism occurs? Based on that only your reduction uh, will again uh, play, come into play. So here, the uh, mechanism of injury is hyperextension injury at the elbow at the fallen outstretched hand. Uh, that leading to olecranon going and uh, forcing the olecranon fossa, which is a thin plate which is present in kids. So whenever there is a force which is going over, that causes break in the olecranon fossa, which is a thin plate, leading to supracondylar humerus fracture. So this is what the image which is showing. You can see that there is a thin plate where the in the olecranon fossa, where, where the pressure goes and causes a break. So low supracondylar or a supracondylar fracture is more common just because of this purpose. Signs and symptoms, what we see in supracondylar. So pain is a most common symptom, which a child presents with failure to use upper extremity. Most of the times the child may present with a deformity. So that is uh, classical in supracondylar is S-shaped deformity. Most of the times we see that. So examination wise, what all things we should see? So tenderness, swelling, ecchymosis, pucker sign. Ecchymosis, pucker sign are the more important signs always keep in your mind. These two signs, if there is ecchymosis and pucker sign, always look for compartment syndrome or distal pulse. Sometimes it may be causing a vascular injury. So there may be a kink or leading to pink pulsus hand. So these two signs are more important, ecchymosis and pucker sign again, the restriction of movements. And if there is any bleeding, you should see for that open fractures. This is a shape shine, what I, uh, what I said you in the last, uh, last slide. So this is a S sign, which is seen in supracondylar humerus because of uh, extension type of injury, where you can see the proximal fragment is going medially and the uh, uh, distal fragment is moving laterally, leading to S shape deformity. This is a S deformity, what we have seen. In supracondylar humerus, this is a pucker sign. What we have seen, this is an example, one of the case example of our uh, institute, where we can see there's a puckering of the skin uh, on the anterior aspect, exactly in the elbow region. This is because of pierce of the proximal fragment into the brachialis muscle coming and kinking over the skin, about to pierce the skin, leading to puckering. So whenever there is a puckering sign or a ecchymosis, always check for the pulse. Based on the pulse status, we classify this into again three types, hand uh, well perfused hand, pulse is present, hand well perfused, but the pulse is absent, hand poorly perfused, cold blanching, and the pulse is absent. So the more uh, alarming is last one, where there definitely there is a vascular injury. So and the second is uh, well perfused hand, but the pulse is absent. That is again alarming sign, which needs urgent intervention. If not, it can go into compartment syndrome. Okay. So red flank signs uh, for possible of compartment syndrome, as I said you already, a tense compartment with ecchymosis, puckering sign again with absent pulse, pain with a passage to extension of fingers, and three A's, not pediatrics because the patient cannot tell about all the other things. So always not five P's in pediatric uh, compartment. You should always see for three A's in pediatric fractures, especially supracondylar, to look for compartment. What are those three A's? Are anxiety. Patient is more anxious. Whatever you do, the patient will never get calm. He'll be very much irritated, and analgesic requirement will be very high. So if these three they, three things are there, always think that the patient is landing up somewhere. Something is wrong. And look for always compartment syndrome in these cases. So this is again uh, in trains point of view, just put aside this. There's something known as thrash lesions. Whenever there is an elbow swelling, so always never get a comparative X-ray to look for any missed lesions. What is the full form of thrash that can be asked in your entrance again? The radiologic radiographic appearance seems harmless. So the radiography might look normal, but definitely there is something going on inside the elbow. Okay, but whenever reading a supracondylar, these two X, these two lines are more important. One is Bowman's angle. What is Bowman's angle will be asked again in your exam as well as clinical point of view as well as in your entrance point of view. What is normal Bowman's angle? How do you draw the Bowman's angle? Is one is the axis of the humerus, draw that line, and other other is perpendicular to it, and the one line which goes tangential to the epiphysis, lateral epicondyle. This is lateral. Uh, this is capital. I'm sorry, the capital arms physial line. What is going on here? 
So draw that line and get the angle. So subtract 90 degrees from this angle, 90 minus alpha. So this alpha angle is known as Bowman's angle. 90 minus alpha is what we see usually after fixation for reduction parameters. So 90 minus alpha, what we should get is more than 10 degrees and alpha angle. This is a Bowman's angle. Normally it is between nine to 60. Uh, it is between uh, 81, 64 to 81 degrees. So if the angle falls between 81 to 64 degrees, then definitely it is a normal angle. Humoro ulnar angle is nothing but a most of the times what we see clinically like a carrying angle. Normal is somewhere between five to 15 degrees the range. So always tell it in a range whenever they asked you in an exam, five to 15 degrees somewhere. So it is around six to 14 degrees. So you can tell somewhere around 11 plus or minus four degrees. So in a lateral view, what you should think of lateral view always look for this 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 signs. So when you're treating a supracondylar humerus, whether the reduction is appropriate or not. First thing is in lateral view, look for always a teardrop, whether it is formed or not. Second important thing you should look for is the third image that is anterior humeral line. When you draw the line along the anterior cortex of humerus, it should pass through the capitulum. So if these two are present, definitely the reduction is appropriate. So this is again an exam point of view. What is Jones axial view of elbow? This can be asked again. So this is a view which, which we get it for a supracondylar humerus where we flex the elbow completely with uh, hand in either pronation or supination depending upon the reduction parameter and get the uh, x-ray. So passing through the forearm. So seeing for the distal humerus. So this view is used more commonly for supracondylar humerus after reduction. So Jones view. So why as I said, uh, Gartland's classification, modified Gartland's classification, those are the x-rays here, what I'm showing you now. So this is a type one. So this is where you can see this arrow line shows there is a hyper uh, hypodense uh, line, what you can see here on this x-ray. This indicates definitely there is a fat pad or something in the joint, which is uh, filling up so that the fat pad is lifted up or the capsule is lifted up, leading to this sign known as fat pad sign. Definitely there is a uh, subtle injury, you know, probably you can think of type 1 supracondylar humerus fracture. This is a type 2 supracondylar humerus fracture. APV is looking absolutely fine, but, in, but the lateral view, when you draw the anterior humeral line, it is not cutting the capital lump. It has gone into posterior aspect. So this is a here where the anterior cortex is broken, but the posterior hinge is intact. This is type 2. While type 3 is completely displaced, so either it can be posterior medial or posterior lateral based on the fragment which is displaced i mean the inferior fragment or the distal fragment which is displaced either medially or laterally so if it is displaced medially it is known as posterior medial displacement if it is displaced laterally which is known as posterior lateral displacement of which posterior lateral is of more concern for us so because the posterior lateral fragment when it is displaced posterior laterally so it, this the anterior fragment will come and poke your artery and nerve so there is a high chance for injury in those cases so whenever there is a posterior lateral type of supracondylar humerus fracture always think of, always examine for vessel as well as nerve injury. Uh, this is a type four guidelines, uh, type four modified guidelines. What it is, is basically a unstable type where the periosteum is completely gone. So when you flex the elbow, the fragment goes into flexion. When you extend the elbow, the fragment goes into extension. It is a highly unstable type. So most of the time, sometimes nowadays we are treating even this kind of fractures closed method, but uh, so sometimes if you're not able to achieve that, you may need to open in these cases. So initial management, whenever the child presents to you in the emergency, whenever there is a swelling, whenever you see the pucker sign, just give us some traction and put a slab in 20 to 30 degrees. So this will help you to relax the fragments and uh, whatever the pulse which was disappeared, you may get it most of the times. So as soon as in the next available slot, take the patient for OT, look for uh, whether the hand is pink or not and the, whether the hand is warm or not and look for the waveforms, what we are seeing here. So whether the waveforms are coming out or not. If they get the waveforms, even if the pulse is absent, think that the, definitely the artery is intact and no need to do. Just go and fix the fix the uh, fracture and come out. That will that most of the times it will suffix. Close reduction and casting. Uh, this is only done for type 1 supracondylar, uh, supracondylar humerus fractures nowadays. So where type 2 is still a controversial. If there is a swelling, there is a high chance for compartment. We can charge, there is a high chance again for loss of reduction. So uh, only type 1 supracondylar humerus is treated conservatively, but rest all the other, other fractures. Uh, most of the times we treat it uh, with a pinning. <clears throat> a direction of displacement is more helpful for the reduction because it because because uh, whether the fragment is displaced medially or laterally, that will help us to know where the periosteum is intact. If the medial periosteum is intact and there is a posterior dislocation, posterior disruption of the fragment, posterior uh, displacement of the fragment, then the fragment will reduce in a flexion with pronation. 
Uh, similarly, the opposite if the fragment is displaced laterally because the periosteum will help us for reduction with the pronation, the medial will pull, uh, medial, medial uh, periosteum water is intact. That will pull the fragment and helps us to helps us to get, get the fragment back into the position. So this is what I said already, the nerve injury with respect to displacement of fragment. So here we can see, so there's a distal fragment is gone towards medially, that is towards the ulna side. So that then what happens is the proximal fragment is poking towards the radial nerve, causing radial nerve injury. Similarly, here the distal fragment, the distal fragment of the supracondylar is moving towards the radial side, lateral side. Then it is proximal fragment is poking the median nerve as well as the artery. So that is a high chance for injury to the nerve and artery. So how do you do close reduction? I take the patient to OT table. We need a proper CM and a reduction. Separate table should be needed with the arm placed over there. This is how the man will do. So one person, the assistant, give the counter traction over the axilla. The other person hold the elbow in 20 to 30 degrees of flexion, give a gentle traction. So if there is a pucker sign, what we see there, the fragment is pierced. That at the time, we need a something known as milking manure, where we need to displace or whatever the puckering is there, we need to get it out by milking it so that uh, the fragment goes inside the muzzle. Then correct it in AP view, in sagittal view, so that it is well aligned. Then this is a milking manure, what I said. Uh, then what we do is keep the thumb over the olecranon and four fingers over the humerus. Then gradually with the traction, flex it. This is what we do. So again, get the Jones view, confirm the reduction. Once your reduction is confirmed in AP and lateral view, those that is the Bowman's angle and the anterior humeral line. If they're falling back, then fix it. So fix it in either of the pattern, whatever is comfortable for you. So, but most preferred fixation, what we do is divergent or a parallel pinning. This is a divergent pinning, what we do. So we start it anteriorly, as I said, posteriorly as you go, there is a chance for no, uh, vascular injury for the capitulum. So always start it either in the mid or in the anterior aspect, not in the posterior aspect. Start it from there and go towards the posterior aspect. That helps us to preserve the vascularity as well as to achieve the reduction. You are, what is the other important thing in this uh, fixation is, uh, they may ask you is uh, pin spread ratio. If the ratio is more than 30%, that is a stable fixation. So always, if they ask you in an exam, what is the pin spread ratio for a supracondylar humerus fracture? That is 30%. So for it to be uh, it to be stable. So acceptable criteria, I said you that Bowman's angle should be more than 10 degrees. That is uh, 90 minus alpha. That is a 90 minus Bowman's angle should be more than 10 degrees in uh, intact medial and lateral columns. Anterior humeral line, when you draw, it should pass through the capitulum. And translation up to 5 mm, that, that uh, helps us to know that is rotation, not basically the translation in the sense there is a rotation of the fragment which is rotated there. When you draw the anterior humeral line, we may see that some portion of it is translated, but it should cut to the capitulum in the center. <coughs> Fracture once reduced uh, to be held and fixed it. So always uh, put a slab in uh, 40 to 60 degrees of flexion. Don't go beyond that. Or if you put it beyond 90 degrees, there is a chance for compartment again. Mm -hmm. So cast it later on, not in urgency. So what we do, what we prefer is uh, put it, fix it, put a slab for one week, then convert it into casting. So open reduction, only what we do is uh, failed close reduction manuals, and then uh, we are not able to achieve close reduction. And if there is an open fracture associated neurovascular injury, then only we open it or else we don't open it. Always we do it in a closed method. So post-op protocol, I said already, get an X-ray between three to seven days to look for any displacement. If it is not there, once the swelling is reduced, convert it into cast. Three to four weeks later, we remove the pins. So don't keep beyond uh, four weeks pins. There is a high chance for stiffness as well as pin tract infection. So this is other case which is uh, involved now nowadays. If they ask you what is type five gut line, you may think that it is not actually involved in the classification, but medial column combination, but the lateral column is intact. Here it always needs a fixation because here the, there is a loss of Bowman's angle. If you leave this, if you treat it conservatively, definitely this is going for Kibetus varus deformity. So always in such cases, medial combination is there, definitely go and fix it, even if it is a type 1. So other thing, what we more important in supracondylar, as I said, was already the pulseless hand. So in case of posterolateral displacement, there is a chance that we get pink pulseless hand. So if there is a pulseless supracondylar humerus fracture, gentle traction as I said you, 30 to 40 degrees, then give a slap, take him to OT immediately, plan for reduction and pinning. If you reduce and pin it, well perfused hand, good pulse is uh, if you got back, go back to the normal thing. If there is a well perfused hand, but still no pulse, just observe it, admit it, observe the patient, uh, then uh, you may get 90%, 95 to 100% of the times, so you get back the pulse later on. So then 
nothing to do much you can send them back they are poorly perfused and no pulse at all even with the uh, oxygen sat pulse ox pulse uh, oximeter we are not finding the wave forms definitely this is an indication this is a danger sign which needs urgent exploration coming to complications of supracondylar humerus fracture the most common complication what we see i mean uh, complication not that most common but uh, some of few other complications what we see is one of them is vascular injury i said you almost it's it's accounts for about 1 to 15% of them so perfusion of hand is a what thing what we see more commonly so if there is a well perfused hand with warm hand and artery capillary refill is less than 3 seconds definitely not to worry if there is less and pale hand then definitely go for urgent intervention so why i said you supratrochlear artery this is a why this is a what is a actually pathology which is going on there in, 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 inside so when there is a supracondylar humerus fracture with a so uh, lateral displacement posterior lateral displacement this supratrochlear artery which is going on the distally uh, distally and winding around the distal fragment is under tension so if this is under intact and if this pulling continuously this is going to kink so the proximal fragment is going to kink the brachial artery so definitely there is no pulse distally once it is it will come back sometimes there may be chance that this can go for intimal injury sometimes occasionally very rarely it can go for laceration of the artery this is another case what we got in our institute so this is a compartment syndrome what we see the patient was uh, having a severely comminuted distal humerus fracture run over by a vehicle then later on uh, he was treated by a quack with a osteopath treatment later on he presented to us on day 3 with a blisters all over with a intense compartment we fixed that and went on to do well anyhow he, he developed the elbow stiffness because of late presentation So this is another case. What we got on the institute. This is an open fracture. The child presented to us just a two-year-old kid. Two years old kid with presented with the open fracture. Where we can see this is a red red arrow mark which I'm pointing it. It is showing a median now which is entrapped between the fragments. So if the patient was having a pink pulse less, we reduced it open because it was an open fracture. We might debride the always own. We debride it, reduced it, and fixed it with the cavers. Went on to do well without any complications later on. This is other thing. This is a X-ray which I showed of the first case which I showed a compartment. the same case which has gone for stiffness because of late presentation and osteopath treatment okay and uh, the other thing is pin tract infection this is other complication if you are keeping the pins beyond 4 weeks always keep in mind keeping it for more number of time the more number of days is a, there is high, always a high chance for infection pin tract infection so pin tract infection is other complication so always remove the pin between 3 to 4 weeks depending upon the age the age less than 5 to 6 years always you can remove it before three, after 3 weeks but if it is beyond 6 uh, 6 years always keep it for at least 4 weeks the if it is around 12 to 13 years of kid age old kid then think of extending it for one week with a cautiousness uh, myositis ossificans this is one of the complications what we see because of osteopath treatment what we get commonly and second thing is because of vigorous physiotherapy post operatively so always in a pediatric cases of supracondylar humerus never ever force the kids to do movement to gain a movement definitely the uh because of early removal of pain within 3 weeks to 4 weeks definitely it will take at least 2 weeks to gain the complete movement but never hurry them or never force them passively for a movement always allow advice for them active movement so definitely we can get a complete range meteo sign this can again be an entrance question which can be asked in your entrance uh, it is a chronic entrapment of a median nerve because of the callus what you are seeing with the hole what we can get it here you can see the some hole here with a complete callus you can see sometimes the median nerve which can be entrapped in between this it can leading to uh, symptoms of those so avascular necrosis i said you fish tail sign uh, this is other thing what you can get it in a distal supracondylar humerus fracture when you are operating it posterior approach or sometimes if there is a low supracondylar very low supracondylar humerus at the time the trochlea can go for avascular necrosis at the time medial epicondyle and a portion of medial condyle which has got a lateral branch so that can be uh, that can be intact while the other other branch can be uh, lateral lateral capital branches will be intact so the trochlea will go for avian in between fragment other fragments will grow that forms a fish tail sign this is what i said you this is a medial thing which is intact but this portion has gone for avascular necrosis okay while the other thing is intact it forms like a fish tail uh symptoms usually occurs later on not immediately because of avian arthritis will develop in the joint and restriction of movements can come cubitus varus this is a gunstock deformity as i said you because of varus collapse if the bowman's angle is not maintained beyond 10 degrees after reduction definitely it is bound to happen most of the times so definitely if it is a cubitus varus it has got lot of complications so it has got a malunion just because of hyperextension as well as rotation and external rotation this is what happens 
uh, most of the time. So you need to correct it back later on. What happens if you're not treating the keyboard as far as? So patients can go for tardy ulnar nerve palsy, first thing. Second thing, these patients, because of cubitus virus deformity, the lateral, lateral condyle is more prominent. They're prone for developing lateral condyle fractures. So hence, always we prefer to operate these cases, so uh, cubitus virus deformity, so to correct that uh, deformity. So this is a case of cubitus virus deformity, which is seen in the right side, uh, right hand. So you can see that there is a hyperextension in these cases because of the fragment going into hyperextension. Definitely, this patient will have restriction of rotation, increased internal rotation compared to external rotation. And this is again the Bowman's angle, which is less because going into the fragment has gone into hyperextension as well as the Bowman's angle is less than 10 degrees. So, definitely, this is gone for cubitus virus deformity, which needs correction later on. Cosmetic purpose, one I said. So if the movement will definitely be normal in these cases because of uh, hyperextension will remodel, but not the rotation. But once the virus is developed, definitely that will be persisting. So because of cosmetic purpose, the most of the times will come for surgery because ideally we need to operate them. As I said, you tardy alano palsy, postal lateral uh, rotatory instability is other thing which can develop in the patients and they are prone for developing lateral condyle fractures. What are the treatment for this? <clears throat> So observation and remodeling, that is in case of very less, I mean, uh, hardly uh, five degrees, less than five degrees of keyboard as far as that can go for remodeling, but that can be treated conservatively. But if it is beyond that, that definitely it, it needs some form of correction. I mean, if it's is, is nowadays, we're not doing it. We're doing only a corrective osteotomy. What are those corrective osteotomies? Uh, is, these are the various corrective osteotomies, but of which modified French osteotomy, dome and step cut osteotomies are nowadays popular. We follow either of the three. Well, depending upon the surgeon's choice, they do that. So other uh, supracondylar humerus fracture uh, coming to is 2% of them. That is a flexion type of supracondylar humerus fracture. Uh, here, here the mechanism of injury is fall on flexion directly over the elbow with the flexed elbow. The, there it we have seen that hyperextension injury. Here we got a flexed injury. So with the elbow directly on the flexion, directly falling over the elbow, the patient can develop this kind of fractures. So if the entrance, if they ask you, which is the most common nerve involved in a supracondylar humerus? Definitely, they're asking you is a extension type of injury. In that cases, anterior introsseous nerve is the most common nerve to be involved, followed by a radial nerve, followed by a median nerve. If then, then then comes the ulnar nerve, which is iodrogenic. So only we are preferring only lateral pinning, not the medial pinning. If they give a specific question asking you that flexion type of supracondylar humerus fracture, what is a nerve involved, then definitely ulna nerve is an option. If you got ulna nerve with the flexion type of supracondylar humerus as a question, definitely ulna nerve is the answer. Mechanism, as I said, you directly fall over the elbow with a flexed elbow, leading to flexion type of injury. So classification, again, it is a undisplaced, angulated with a cortical hinge and totally unstable type where the fragment is going either into flexion or extension, needs fixation. So treatment again, I said you, this uh, type one is again conservative and type two always needs reduction, but uh, uh, it, it fragments with the supracondylar humerus inflection type usually reduces in extension. There we go is to keep the arm in and the joint in flexion, but here we keep them in extension. So with the elbow in extension, the fragments will fall back, then correct in sagittal plane, and then after reduction, fix them with the pinning. So third, third unstable types always needs a reduction. So it is again, most of the times we do uh, closed only. If it is not coming back, then go for open reduction. So I said you, anterior medial, anterior is the most common approach what we perform, not a posterior approach. Occasionally that too, very rarely we do, but we are not doing nowadays a posterior approach. Then examination of elbow, uh, coming that is the end of supracondylar humerus. The examination of elbow, <clears throat> so, uh, coming to elbow, elbow joint is a complex synovial joint. It constitutes of a ulnar humeral, radio capitular, and a proximal radial nerve joint. So, how to examine an elbow? So, whenever there is a case which is given to you in your exams with a, uh, the elbow case, so what are the things you should go ahead? So, always start with the inspection. So, it should be covered in the following headings. Start with inspection, palpation, then you comes your range of motion, then comes your measurements, then comes your special test. Though under these five headings, always uh, <coughs> do your examination of elbow. So coming to inspection, first thing and foremost thing is look for the attitude of the elbow. What is the attitude of elbow? The patient is keeping it in flexion position or it is in the extension position or it is a hyper extension. So you should know. So because if it is if it is in the flexed position, whether it is because of any effusions or any swellings or because of any old trauma, which is caused a fixed contracture leading to flex. So that attitude always 
first and foremost thing is to look for is attitude. So if there is a flexion, they always look for effusions or if there is any swellings. If there is any old scars, operated scars, you should always look for that. So any sinuses, if there is an infection, always look for sinuses if you're suspecting infection. And if there is any swelling, what are the examples of swelling around the elbow? You can get as a one you can you can think of as most common in elbow, they can give you one swelling is myositis also you can see may get it so it is notorious for stiffness elbow because of myositis besides look for effusion where you can look for effusions is so radio capillary joint that is on the posterior lateral fossa and other thing is hollowness of olecranon with the flexion of movement of the elbow the olecranon usually you can feel that and compared to opposite side it will be hollow what you can make out but whenever there is a fullness around the olecranon fossa Definitely think of, definitely there is a, some effusion which is going on. It can be because of septic arthritis, it can be because of tuberculosis, it can be because of rheumatoid arthritis, there can be effusion early. So similarly, so we'll always look for that. So compare the carrying angle with the opposite side. Inspection, so first attitude, then comes your any old scars, sinuses, if there is any deformity such as cubitus virus, think of that. So and then look for uh, effusions, uh, fullness, I mean, where, where exactly the correction is, but with the movement, you can make out that. And then your carrying angle. So always look for carrying angle comparing to the opposite side. Okay, the, the, this comes your inspection part, then comes your palpation. First and foremost thing you should look for in palpation is local rise of temperature. So always palpate it first on normal side, then comes the abnormal side. So look for local rise of temperature and tenderness. First, look for tenderness around the any points. I mean, bony, bony prominences. What you can palpate in elbow is so medial condyle, middle supracondylar ridge, lateral condyle, lateral supracondylar ridge, and then comes your elbow joint. Always or, or even palpate the radial head, radial head for to look for rotations. So look whether the radial head is free or it is moving or not. If there is any subluxation of radial head, these things you should look for in palpation. <clears throat> and if there is any bony tenderness over there. And other things what you can look in is uh, in palpation is uh, irregularities, bony irregularities, especially if it is a malignated fractures. Uh, supracondylar residue, there will be rotations, definitely, there will be unevenness around the borders of the supracondylar ridges, medial and lateral. So, if there is an irregularity on the borders, definitely there is some fracture or a, some swelling which is going on there old. So, swelling if present, look, where exactly it is located, especially in myositis, we find it in the biceps, a brachialis, and as well as in the triceps. More commonly, what we see is in a brachialis muscle. So, swelling if present, look for it, where exactly it is located. If it is a myositis, if it is any other swellings, comment on it. So a synovial thickening can also be present. It should be, it can be palpated on the supracondylar ridges on either side of the olecranon fossa. But it is a bit duffy in consistency. Location where exactly the swelling located. If it is anterior, because of bony hardening swelling, which gets, which is prominent, which <coughs> uh, which disappears or bony swellings usually disappears with the muscle contraction. So biceps when it is contracted, sometimes it will get dis uh, disappears gradually. So what is the consistency of the swelling? Whether it is a bony heart, soft tissue, if there is a fluctuant, sometimes it is, uh, if it is a septic arthritis, definitely the swelling will be sub fluctuant. Extent and the mobility of the swelling, you should know always. So if there is any abnormal mobility, if there is a bone palpation, there may be tenderness. Sometimes there is something more common what we see in abnormal mobility we find is in a lateral condyle. Lateral condyle is not always for non-union. So always fix when we get a cases of a lateral condyle, always we fix it. So if there is a uh, thinking that there is a lateral condyle fracture, definitely always palpate the lateral condyle. Look for any abnormal mobility around that lateral condyle. Then palpate for the ulna now. This is the last to do. So it usually in 20 degrees of flexion of the elbow, we palpate for the ulna now. Look for its thickening if there is any tenderness of the ulna now. And if the ulna now moves, uh, <coughs> if it uh, dislocates from its position, then what we get is tardy ulna now, especially in case of cubitus virus, because there is no stretch on the ulna now. Then how do you get a tardy ulna now? So tardy ulna now we get just because the ulna now moves to and fro around the middle epicondyle in case of cubitus virus deformity. So because of that only we develop radial lana. So then comes your movements. First and foremost thing is you should look for movement with the elbow in extension. Elbow started extension. Look for whether you're getting complete extension or not. So normally we get up to 10 degrees of hyper extension. That is normal compared to opposite side. If you're not, if you're getting till neutral, that's fine. If you're not getting, then most common what we get in stiffness of elbow is flexion contracture. So that can be compensated. That will be compensated most of the times by shoulder. Shoulder, if it goes for external rotation, definitely <clears throat> you can think that the elbow is completely in extension. So fix the shoulder, make sure that your arm is rested on the table. Then you extend the elbow, then look for 
whether there is no shoulder movement then you check for elbow extension what is the range of extension if you able to get complete extension that's good if not whatever the range your extension is lagging that is known as fixed flexion deformity from there your further movement you can comment on it and throughout the range you should comment whether it is painful or painless <clears throat> And normal range of elbow flexion is up to 140 degrees, 140 to 145, they say. 140 degrees, you can keep it as a range. And whatever the range you get, that is it. But what is the functional range of elbow? This is a common question they can ask you again. That is 30 to 120 degrees. If you get this range, it is sufficient for your elbow to function properly. Okay. So what is a normal range is again 0 or 10 degrees of hyperextension to 140 degrees. What is the functional range of elbow? That is up to 30 to 120 degrees is what we get. Other movements, what we get is a proximal radial joint that is supination pronation. Proximal radial joint and distal radial joint with the interosseous membrane are helpful for this movement of supination and pronation. How do you check it? <coughs> Always compare with the opposite side. Use a pen, a uh, pen holding in both the arms, and then keep uh, from the mid prone position, rotate its supination, and go for pronation. Check the angle which is formed with respect to the tough arm. Here you have shown a goniometer where you can see that it is resting over the arm and range of pronation and range of supination. What you get it with respect to the tough forearm. So whatever the range you're getting, that is the range of pronation. Pronation is less compared to supination. Pronation is around 70 degrees, 0 to 70 degrees, while the supination is up to 80 degrees normally. So coming to measurements, what are the measurements we look for elbow? So always when you are examining the elbow, make sure you mark all the bony landmarks. So always mark medial epicondyle, lateral epicondyle, and the tip of olecranon. So when you draw this in a 90 degrees of elbow flexion from the posterior aspect, it should form a near isosceles triangle. This measurement, this length, that is from tip of olecranon to medial epicondyle, tip of olecranon to capitulum. Together, it will form a near same measurement while the capitulum to medial epicondyle is the hypotenuse. So this is what it forms usually. So with the 90 degrees of flex elbow, if this, this measurement you're getting, definitely the bony landmarks are normal. There is no intra-articular or intracondylar pathology. Definitely, whatever there is a deformity, it can be supracondylar pathology. So this is the other line. What we do in extension, these three should touch each other. These three should fall in one line when you get it in extended elbow. Other, uh, other measurement, what you do in elbow examination is a carrying angle that is a <coughs> Humero-ulnar angle. So how do you do that? So basically you should mark again the landmarks as I said you. So medial epicondyle, lateral epicondyle, connect them and that is a, get the center point of that. First thing. Second thing is mark that tip of acromion. Take it anteriorly. And then comes distally. Distally you should mark distal wrist, radial styloid and the ulnar styloid together and uh, center of that. So draw the axis of mid axis of the forearm connecting those two lines, center of uh, the radial steroid and ulnar steroid, as well as center of lateral epicondyle and middle epicondyle. Other line from the acromion towards the center of middle and lateral epicondyle. <clears throat> so this angle, whatever is forming here, this is your carrying angle. So normally it should, as I said you already, it is 11 plus or minus four degrees. Then comes special tests of elbow. What are the special tests of elbow? So there are special tests what you should do. Without this test, it is elbow examination is incomplete. So of which more important special tests. These are the tests while for clinical practice purpose. That is a Cousin's test in golfer's elbow test. But what they can keep you, if at all, if they keep you in exams is uh, for tests, what you should comment is basically medial and lateral varus, varus valgus stress test. Look for collateral ligaments and then comes postlateral rotatory instability test. How to do that? I'll show you. Uh, this is a varus valgus. So hold the, <coughs> this is a valgus stress. You're giving outward pull. So you're checking for the medial ligaments, medially ulnar collateral ligament. So you're giving a varus, uh, val, uh, this is a valgus stress with the, your hand over the elbow, pushing it towards medially and pulling the forearm outwards. So this will put tension over the ulnar collateral ligament. If it is pain or if there is an opening compared to opposite side, definitely the ligament is gone. This tests are done with 20 degrees of flexion of elbow. Similarly, the opposite for the virus test to look for uh, radial collateral ligament. Here, we give stress from the medial aspect and we push the forearm towards the center. Then you should look for if there is any lateral opening that compared to opposite side. If it is so, definitely there is a lateral ligaments which are gone. So this comes posterior lateral rotatory instability. How to do this? So with the patient lying supine, arm in hyperextended position, taking up over the head, then 
flexing the forearm, flexing the elbow with uh, examiner holding the arm in the examiner holding with his hand over the wrist and holding the arm in supination, giving axial load with rotation. I mean, supination, axial load with valgus stress. So all this provides lateral instability. Valgus stress will provide lateral instability. So then look for if there is any dislocation. If it is so, definitely that is postlateral instability of the elbow. Apprehension test. Patient will not allow you to do it. So because of pain, he feels that the elbow is coming out. So for that purpose, he will not allow you. Definitely, this is looking for instability. So whenever there is an instability case which is kept, this is a one thing. Second thing is a virus valgus stress test. With the specialty test, so your examination will be complete. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. It was indeed a very comprehensive class and we are very thankful to you for this class, sir. And um, that's one doubt, sir. Uh, tell, asking yeah. uh, why uh, middling deformity is a volar displacement. Then uh, why it is called as a colis like sir, like a dinner folk deformity? That is a colis fracture is dinner folk because it is mimicking like that. The fracture, the distal fragment, which is displaced posteriorly and the proximal fragment, that is the distal radius, proximal fragment and distal fragment are there. Distal fragment, which is displaced posteriorly and the proximal fragment, which is there, which is displaced anteriorly. When you see in the lateral view of X-ray, it forms like a dinner fork. What we have it for our having some uh, snacks and all. So it looks like exactly like a dinner fork. For that purpose, it was called like a colis fracture. Nowadays, we are not using the term colis fracture. And mid lung deformity is completely different entity. That is a congenital deformity, what we see, where, where there is something known as Vickers ligament, where there is, dif uh, where, which is a puckering or the, which is a tethering kind of thing. That ligament is found on the medial aspect, that is towards the lunate fossa of the radius, which is not forming uh, the bone, I mean, especially the uh, distal radius, medial aspect that is towards the lunate fossa. We are not seeing the bone growing there, leading to displacement. That is ulnar towards ulnar as well as ulnar displacement. That is exactly the main deformity. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 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 Thank you